This is the kind of excitement that uh, comes with a Packer victory, isn't it? No, we're all here uh, for lots of uh, really important reasons, and uh, I'm really delighted to welcome you. Uh, you know you're getting old when in the course of three years you find yourself needing to put on glasses. Um, but it's my real privilege to welcome you to the CEO Breakfast and Strategy Series hosted by the Schneider School of Business Ec Economics right here at St. Omer College. I am Brian Brees, the President of St. Omer College, and it's my distinct privilege to welcome you all here. And what a wonderful turnout. John, we're all excited to hear from you today. Uh, but this marks the 22nd year of the CEO Breakfast and Strategy Series, and by my count, we'll have uh, entertained over 170 speakers, uh, some of the region's best leaders by the end of this year's programming. And that's a remarkable uh, amount of brain power assembled in a single form. And we're proud uh, to be able to have sponsored this program uh, for over two decades. This is the second year that the series has been held under the auspices of the Schneider School of Business and Economics. The mission of our Schneider School is to, in part, to serve as the hub for business intelligence in Northeast Wisconsin. And I think this breakfast series fits beautifully into that, uh, adding to the world-class programs we offer our undergraduate and graduate students, the services provided by the Center for Exceptional Leadership, the Center for Business and Economic Analysis, and the Strategic Research Institute. And I'm pleased that all of you are here keeping this important endeavor and conversation going about how best to drive the economic <coughs> success and vitality of this region that we all care so much about. The CEO Breakfast Series provides area executives with the opportunity to hear from some of our top CEOs, and today uh, is no different. This wonderful resource is brought to you by the generosity of our presenting sponsor, Myron Construction, title sponsors Johnson Financial Group, Davis Kielthau Attorneys at Law, and Insight Publications. The sponsor of today's session is WPS Health Solutions. Can you please give our sponsor a round of applause for their support? If you're looking for seats, there are more seats. There's a table right up here. Nobody wants to sit in the front pew, apparently. Uh, so come up. There's a couple tables up front. Uh, uh, grab a seat. Uh, but I'd like to, uh, before we partake uh, in breakfast and get this going, I'd like to uh, invite us uh, for a moment of prayer. Uh, and so I invite you uh, to bow your heads uh, just for a moment of prayer. And we invite uh, a reminder that we are always in the presence of the Lord. We uh, ask uh, great thanks and we offer great thanks and gratitude for the many blessings we have for the beauty of a fresh snowfall, uh, for the joy and the, the friendship of being together with our company here today, for the opportunity to hear wisdom from our speaker and to engage in matters of importance to us. We also ask blessings for those who are less fortunate. In particular, I ask us to think about those who go without and for those who are struggling and suffering with sickness or illness. For them, we offer our prayers and support. And for the food we're about to uh, take in and to nourish our souls and our bodies, we pray together. Bless us, O Lord, Amen. these thy gifts which you're about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bon appetit. Can I uh, invite us to give our, our wait staff and the kitchen staff a round of applause for a wonderful uh, breakfast? <laughs> a little quick infomercial. I, I've uh, told a few of you that uh, we're very proud of our food service. Uh, for a number of years, we were ranked number 13th in the country. Uh, but a couple months ago, we learned that the food apparently got better because we moved up to number nine now. <laughs> And of course, that makes us number one in the state of Wisconsin. But there, there you have it. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Mr. John McHugh, Director of Corporate Communications, Leadership Development, and Training for Tri uh, Quick Trip uh, Incorporated, based out of La Crosse, Wisconsin, on the western side of the state. In his role at Quick Trip, he has helped the company achieve recognition as a top workplace, as listed by the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel the Minneapolis Star Tribune, and the Des Moines Register. Prior to joining Quick Trip in 2004, John was an instructor and principal at Aquinas High School in La Crosse. He holds degrees from the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, and the Georgian University in Rome, Italy. John sits on the boards of Trust Point, National Mutual Benefit Society, Viterbo University, and the Mayo Clinic Health System 
in La Crosse. I didn't tell him this, but he probably knows my sister and brother-in-law who work in that same uh, health care facility. He and his wife Maggie enjoy living at their log home near Sparta, Wisconsin, a beautiful part of the country. Today, John will present purpose and compassion at Quick Trip. Everyone, please welcome Director of Corporate Communications, Leadership Development, and Training for Quick Trip, Mr. John McHugh. We have uh, one of our store leaders some time ago was out at the pumps changing out the garbage when one of our elderly guests pulled up. Uh, internally, we don't refer to people as customers, so we call them guests. He was an elderly guy, saw that she worked at Quick Trip because of the blue uniform, and said, hey, hey I, I see you work here. Uh, how do I put gas in my car? And she said, well, that's a pretty simple process. Are you going to pay at the pump or are you going to pay inside? He said, well, well I'm going to pay inside like everybody does. I, I didn't know you could pay at the pump. She said, means you're going to hit the little button on the dispenser that says pay inside. And she helped him dispense about 12 gallons of fuel. They were done. He said, hey, hey, hey hang on. I, I have a second question. How do I know if I need oil in my engine? She said, well, that's pretty simple as well. Let me show you. So she went to the driver's side of the car, uh, found the latch for the hood, popped it open. They went to the front of the automobile, and she said, sir, we're, we're going to put this rod in place so that the hood doesn't come back and hit you on the noggin. And I, I know there's a lot of parts in here. It looks pretty confusing, but we're going to look for something that they call a dipstick. So she grabbed some paper towel from the dispenser and wiped off the dipstick and said, sir, can you see the little line that's etched in this little metal stick? Yeah. Well, we're going to put that stick back in your engine, and the black smudge has to come up to that line. They checked his oil. It was perfect. And she said, sir, next time when you do this on your own, if the smudge is below the line, that means you're low on oil. And come into the store, and one of our coworkers will find out what kind of oil you need for your engine and where it goes inside here. But today it looks like you're, you're fine. He said, oh, no, hang on, third question. How do I know if I need air in my tires? And she said, well, that's pretty simple as well. Why don't you pull over to the side of the lot where we have the air compressor, and, and I'll show you how to use that. So he pulled his car over, and they both knelt down on the pavement next to his tires. And again, she was real patient with him. She said, sir, there's a lot of numbers on the side of your tire here, but we're going to look for a number right before an abbreviation, PSI, and that means pounds per square inch. And that's the number that we're going to tap into this little machine we call an air compressor. That's going to fill your tires. They checked all four tires. They were perfectly fine. And they both stood up. And she said, sir, I, I think you're good to go. He said, ma'am, I'm going to be real honest with you. I know how to pump my own gas. Uh, I've always pumped my own gas. <coughs> Secondly, I know how to check the oil in my engine. Matter of fact, I, I don't even take my car to a mechanic to have the oil changed. I change my own oil. I know how to do this. Thirdly, I've never had a tire go down because of a lack of air pressure. I know how to check the air in my tires. But he said, I came here today to see if what they say about you at Quick Trip is true. I heard that you take care of people. He said, I'm glad to know that it's true that you take care of people. Because I found out this week that I have terminal cancer. In three months, I won't be here. My wife and I have been married 53 years, and she's never had to pump gas. She's never had to check the oil in our engine. She's never had to check air in our tires. And I want to make sure there's some place where she can come after I'm gone that they'll take care of her. He said, I'm glad to know what they say about you is true, that you take care of people. He since passed away, and she shows up at our store every week, and our coworkers pump the gas for her. And as you probably well know, we are not a full-service gas station. <laughs> <laughs> they check the oil in her engine, and to give her a peace of mind and remind her of how well her husband used to take care of her, they check all four tires. And when Deanna, our store leader, told me the story, I said, Deanna, why did you do it? She said, John, you know exactly why I did it. It's our mission here at Quick Trip. Our mission at Quick Trip, believe it or not, is not to sell gasoline and hot dogs. It's not our mission. Uh, our mission is to treat others as you'd like to be treated. That's our, that's our stated mission statement. It, it's the golden rule uh, applied to business. And the reason why we do that is because we believe that's how we engage um, almost 26,000 coworkers in 700 locations, by having a sense of purpose. Make sure that what they do really matters. A sense of purpose and a sense of compassion.
Now, I know this breaks all the rules of PowerPoint presentations, too many words on the screen. People in the back of the room probably can't even read it. The training department yells at me when I do this. But this quote is too good to pass up. It's from Jim Collins. Many of you have read him. Uh, Built to last, good to great. He talks about what makes businesses 16 times more profitable than the stock market average. Okay? Now keep in mind as I read this that this guy's hardcore business. He's not a philosopher. He doesn't teach religion. He's not a poet. He's hardcore business. But he said if you want engaged employees, make sure they can plug into this statement. For in the end, it's impossible to have great life unless it's a meaningful life. It's very difficult to have meaningful life without meaningful work. Perhaps then you might gain that rare tranquility that comes from knowing that you've had a hand in creating something of intrinsic excellence that makes a contribution. Indeed, you might even gain the deepest of all satisfactions, knowing that your short time here on this earth has been well spent and that it mattered. That's a business author saying if you want engaged employees, make sure they know what they do matters and it has a sense of purpose beyond just making a buck. Well, one of the ways in which we encourage that at Quick Trip is to celebrate that purpose. Uh, back in 2004, when we actually first started our, our, what we call our, our internal cultural revolution to become known as a, a great place to work and a place where customer service is valued, that year we received unsolicited 21 customer compliment letters <laughs> where 21 guests wrote into the corporate office and said, hey, I had a, this great experience at Quick Trip. You need to know about it. 21 letters that year, company-wide. And so we, we discussed internally with the senior management, well, what do we do with those letters? Well, up until that stage, they just uh, got put in a drawer someplace. And after the CEO read them, they disappeared. So we decided, why don't we take those letters? And every Wednesday, there's a newsletter that comes out to all of our stores, and we'll publish those letters. And if we know who the coworker is that did that great thing, we'll reward them with a gift card. It's valued at about $80 to $90 um, from a place called uh, the Recognition Company out of Milwaukee. Uh, and that if they become really good stories, I'll use them in training and in public relations. This last fiscal year for us, we received unsolicited 2,355 letters. Unsolicited. Now sometimes when you come into our store on a Wednesday and you see a coworker reading our newsletter, sometimes there's not a dry eye in the store because um, of these great letters. How do you go from 21 to 2,355? Goodness celebrated creates more goodness. That when you talk about and you celebrate the great things that you do, when those people get put in a similar situation, you know what behavior they do? The story they just read. Let me share you my favorite one. Thank you for hiring caring people. That's why I'm writing you today. Your staff continues to show respect to me and my family, even though my son constantly steals from them. <laughs> <laughs> In our industry, that's not a good thing, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> On a side note, uh, we don't have much. On Saturday in February, it was snowing pretty badly outside. My son was on the curb outside your store cleaning the snow out of his shoes. He didn't have any socks on because we just don't have money right now for new ones. Your staff member, Matt, was outside shoveling. He asked my son if he was okay. Then he took his own socks off and gave them to my son. It gives a whole new meaning to giving someone the shirt off your back. Thank you for hiring compassionate people. When we got the letter, I was so touched, I contacted Jessica, our store leader. I said, hey, I received this really touching letter. Do you know anything about this? And this is what Jessica emailed back. John, I was working when this happened. After Matt did this, he came into my office and he cried because he felt so badly for that kid. I'm very proud of Matt. He'll be with our company a year this May. He's 18 years old and still in high school. Kids these days, huh? You know? Well, I contacted Matt. I said, Matt, why did you do it? He said, well, John, you know why I did it. You told me the very first day in the job that the most important thing I'm supposed to be doing was not selling stuff to people, but to treat others as you'd like to be treated. So I was just trying to do, do that. Now, I would venture to say, and I'll talk about this, that, that Matt knew that long before he ever came to work for Quick Trip is that obviously he was raised in a family where the golden rule was a value. And so the catch is, how do you find those kind of people and replicate those kinds of experiences? Well, we believe that compassion exhibits itself in some little ways uh, at Quick Trip. Uh, and I'm going to break some rules of customer service this morning. Um, you know the old adage that the customer is always right? Have you ever heard that, those of you who work with customers? 
It's not true. <laughs> uh, we have 8.5 million guests a week. The customer's always right. It's not true. Sometimes the customer's wrong. It's not anything we did and not bad product and not bad services. Like that person's got uh, something going on. You know, the customer's wrong. But how do you treat wrong customers with compassion to win their loyalty? Because at QuickTrip, we don't aim simply for customer satisfaction. Customer satisfaction is a disaster. You've done the studies. 85% um, of all people who describe <coughs> themselves as satisfied with the business shortly thereafter jumped to the competition because somebody didn't simply satisfy them but they took your product or your service and they didn't simply satisfy them, they wowed them. And so you go from the place where you're satisfied to the place where you're wowed. And how do you wow people? It, it's not through price point. Um, the cheapest does not create loyalty, we believe. Even though we could beat the big box retailers and all of our products by 10%, we do. Loyalty is not created off the best locations. Sometimes we don't have the best locations. We believe loyalty is created through compassionate relationships, where even if you're wrong, we still treat you with compassion and with human dignity. I'll give you an example. 80% of all the products inside a Quick Trip store we make or produce ourselves out of La Crosse. Uh, we're the most vertically integrated convenience store chain in the United States. We have our own bakery, our own dairy, our own commissary, our own ice plant, beverage line, you name it, we have it. All the milk uh, comes from the farms right around La Crosse. Uh, it starts coming into our dairy about 4.30 a.m. Uh, it's about 8.30 in the morning is when the last truck uh, has delivered milk. That milk gets processed immediately. We make our own milk jugs. We have our own blow mold facility. The milk jug is made. The milk goes into the milk jug. The cap goes on. It gets shipped out to the stores. So tonight, 5 o'clock, if you're heading home, you go, geez, I need milk. And you stop at one of the quick trips. Uh, there's a good chance that that milk was in the belly of the cow within the last 24 hours. We don't publicize this, but it means our milk will last for two weeks past the expiration date. Because okay? the only place you're getting it fresher is if you're living on the farm, you're getting it out of the bulk tank. You know? So we pride ourselves on fresh milk. Well, one of our guests knew this very well and walked into our store with a, a half gallon of 2% milk and found the store leader and said, you at Quick Chip, you pride yourselves on fresh milk? This is disgusting. This milk is bad. Smell this. So the store leader took the cap off and put her nose in it. And like, it was bad. I don't know, I just wouldn't take your word for it why you have to put your nose in it, but that's fine. <laughs> and Storley said, ma'am, I apologize, that's bad milk. Um, why don't you go back to the, the milk cooler and get two half gallons uh, there on us today? And in the meantime, while the guest was going back to the milk cooler, the store leader rang up for her a $10 gift card. So the guest came up to the counter, put the two half gallons on. Again, the store leader apologized and said, ma'am, I, I apologize, that milk is bad. Uh, those two half gallons, that's on us today. Um, here's a $10 gift card for your troubles. I'm so sorry. So the guest went from dissatisfied to satisfied to loyal all in one fell swoop because we treat you with a compassion. Well, that night she was at home. The guest was at home and she said to her husband, yep, bad milk, took it back to Quick Trip. They did me right. They gave me two half gallons for free and a $10 gift card for my trouble. And her husband said, why did you take it to Quick Trip? It wasn't their milk. <laughs> He said, we, we, we got that from the grocery store. They have their own nature's touch. They don't, they don't sell the brand that you had. And she's like, oh, no, are you serious? He's like, yeah, it wasn't Quick Trip Milk. So to her defense, she came back the next day to apologize. She found the store leader. She said, ma'am, I was very upset with you yesterday about the bad milk. You gave me two half gallons for free, uh, this $10 gift card. Uh, last night at dinner, my husband told me it wasn't your milk. And our store leader said, yeah, I knew it was in our milk. I saw on the label that it wasn't ours. <laughs> and the guest was perplexed, and she said, well, well, why didn't you say to me yesterday, sorry, lady, it's not my problem. I didn't sell it to you. And our store leader said right out of our training manual, ma'am, the goal was not to win the argument. The goal is to win your loyalty. The goal is not to win the argument. The goal is to win your loyalty. And if I can win your loyalty for all of 15 bucks, that's what we're called to do. Uh, two half gallons of milk, $5, a $10 gift card, $15. Well, we've done the studies. We know that that woman will tell that story on average to 12 people. And when you, all is said and done, and now it's an average. It doesn't break up this neatly all the time. Half those people hadn't shopped at Quick Trip. Now they start shopping with us. The other half who had been shopping with us, who had been satisfied, now become loyal guests. And a loyal guest for us spends twice as much as a satisfied guest. And when you do the math on that story, that story, that $15 will generate for our store in one year, $43,200 in sales. Now, for those of you who have a marketing background, would you spend 15 bucks for $43,000 in sales? <laughs> it's a marketing no-brainer. 
Now, we could have won the argument. Clear as, clear as day. I said, ma'am, sorry, but that's not our milk. But we wouldn't have won her loyalty, and we certainly wouldn't have won all those sales. So sometimes treating people with compassion, even when the customer's wrong, generates a sense of internal and external compassion. Here's the other piece we do to create a, a culture of compassion, not simply within our stores, but within our communities. Um, my hope is that uh, some of you are, are, are guests of ours. But if you come to a quick trip uh, and you come into the store and we'll say, well, did you have fuel outside? Uh, and the reason why we ask that is that most of our drive offs at, at quick trip are accidental. Uh, people know the clerk and they start chatting and they forget that they had gas on pump 12. So that's why we ask you. Secondly, we say, hey, glazers are on sale today. Would you like a, a, a six pack of glazers? You know? <laughs> Does anybody know what's one of the last things we say to you in that transaction? Oh, nice job. Thank you. Yeah. See you next time. See you tomorrow. It's called the return comment. It has nothing to do with increased profitability. It has nothing to do with increased sales. It has everything to do with creating a culture of compassion. And what we're tapping into is, if you've ever studied psychology, and you studied a guy by the name of Maslow. Remember Maslow? And he had the hierarchy of needs. And one of the needs that we all have as a human being is the need to belong. We need to know that there's some places where we can go where we're always welcome. So what we're trying to recreate is something my grand mother did for me back in the farm in Phillips, Wisconsin. We'd go visit Grandma for the weekend, and when we were leaving on Sunday afternoon, just about to get in the car, Grandma would give you a big hug. And she'd say, you know, Johnny, Grandma loves to see you. You know you're always welcome at Grandma's. You know if you ever need Grandma, you just pick up the phone and you call Grammy. You know that Grandma's always happy to see you. Well, as kids, when things weren't going well at home, instinctively, who did we turn to? Grandma. Why? Because she mastered the return comments, you know. <laughs> she never let you leave without you knowing you're always welcome there. Here's how we know it works at Quick Trip. Some time ago, we got a five-page letter from a guest in Anago, Wisconsin. You could tell it was an elderly guy by the handwriting. And the first paragraph said, I love your store in Anago. Uh, I love the no-fee ATM. I love the price of the bananas. Coworkers are always friendly. And then he goes off for four and a half pages on religion, on politics, <laughs> on conspiracy theories. <laughs> and the last line, last line of the letter was, and I have other things to say to you, call me with his phone number. <laughs> well, Don, our CEO, uh, reads all the letters first. He's always the first one to read them, and then he gives them to whoever needs to deal with the issue. So that morning, Don came to me with the letter, and he said, John, can you do me a favor? Could you call this guy back? <laughs> Well, after I read the letter, I knew once I get this guy on the phone, this is not going to be a short conversation. So I, I waited until I had a full hour blocked out of my calendar. Uh, and finally, I, I called him. I said, sir, my name is John McHugh. I'm Director of Public Relations for Quick Trip. And I want to thank you for the very nice letter. And he goes off for 47 minutes. Nonstop. I don't say a word. I, I know because I got the timer on my phone, you know. He goes off on religion, politics, who shot JFK, and how there's a connection to Anago, Wisconsin. And he <laughs> believes it, okay? <laughs> Well, the conversation's winding down, and finally I said, Sir, anything else? <laughs> oh, yeah. One more thing. I was in your store two days before Christmas. I bought a banana and a pint of milk. And when I paid for it at the register, the young lady said, Stop back again. I like that. <laughs> I said, Sir, I I'm glad you like it. It's called the return comment at Quick Chip. Uh, we train for it. Uh, we actually evaluate for it. We send secret shoppers around making sure that we do it a majority of the times. And he got upset with me. He said, you're not listening to me. She meant it. I said, well, I hope she meant it. I don't want any of our coworkers saying like they're robots. And he got even tested with me. He said, sir, you aren't listening to what I'm saying. That young lady said I was always welcome there. And I could tell he was getting emotional. So I stopped. And I said, sir, is there more to this story? Yeah. He said it was two days before Christmas. I, uh, we gather the, the kids and the grandkids together a couple days before the actual holiday. It's just easier to get them together when it's not the actual day of Christmas itself. And sometimes when I'm with my family, I have this tendency to go off on religion and politics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're probably doing. He says, so that night I did like I always did. And as I was leaving, my daughter came up to me and said, Dad, when you come here for Christmas and you go off on all your tangents, it's not fun to have you with us. So he said, I left my family on Christmas knowing I wasn't always welcome. I walked in your store and all I bought was a banana and a pint of milk and that young lady told me I was always welcome there. It's good to know that there's some places you can go for Christmas where you're always welcome. Click. 
Well, I, I found out who the coworker was through our video system, and I called her. I said, hey, did you know that that's what was going on when you said stop back again? She said, John, I, I didn't have a clue, but I say it like I always do, uh, and I mean it. You know, we, we have 8.5 million guests a week in our stores, in 700 stores. We have no clue what's going on in their personal lives. We have no idea what happened to them at their place of employment before they stopped with us. And what we hope is that, and what we believe is that in, in this day in our world, the thing that we need more of is compassion. Of people looking you straight in the eye, not in the phone, but saying, you know what? Hey, I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, stop back again. Uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow when you get your cup of coffee. That that simple human interaction creates that sense of compassion in our communities, in our world. We think we need that, uh, and if we can be a, a facilitator, that, that's important to us. <coughs> well, as I mentioned, uh, some people say, well, your, your customer service at QuickTrip is pretty good. You guys must have a phenomenal training program. Uh, and I can say this because I oversee the training program. We don't. <laughs> um, we, we really don't have a great training program at QuickTrip. It's not about the training. It's about the hiring. Because if you're bad to the bone, there's not a darn thing I can do in a training program that's going to fix that, you know? No matter how extensive the training program is. So for us, we interview for a fit with our compassionate culture. And here's the first three interview questions we have for all of our positions. Whether you're making the donuts back in La Crosse, or you're delivering the donuts on the truck, or you're selling the donuts. Here's the first three questions we ask. Tell me about the last random act of kindness you did for someone. Number two, how have you made a difference in someone's life this month? And number three, how have you treated others as you'd like to be treated? Golden rule, applied to business. And if you can't answer those first three questions, we don't go any further in the interview process. But if you can answer them, you know what we know about that candidate? Probably a pretty good person. Live by the golden rule, uh, they're other-centered, they have a sense of compassion, they've, they've been raised well. Uh, and we'll hire them and bring them on. Uh, for us at QuickTrip, fortunately, we can be selective. Uh, last year, we had a total of 4,000 openings in the company. And that's because of uh, all the new stores we're building, the expansion, um, some turnover. But for those 4,000 openings last year, we had 136,000 applications. You know, when you get be known as a top workplace, it, it's actually harder to get into QuickTrip right now than it is Harvard or Stanford, <laughs> and we're okay with that, okay? <laughs> Because it means that we can be selective. It means that in the interview, if the first seven candidates don't have that, we don't hire them. We, it's not about the training, it's about the hiring. Well then once we get them on, um, I'm going to talk about how we do train. And I'm actually going to use uh, the very first story that I use with our brand new coworkers on their first date. If we go into a new market, brand new market uh, for us, um, I actually go out into the road and do live training uh, with the coworkers for the first couple days. Um, so when we moved up into uh, Duluth, Superior Market, brand new, I went up there for the summer, a couple summers ago it was in St. Cloud. Uh, this last summer it was down in Des Moines, it's going to be a new market for us. So I, I do live training. Here's the very first story I tell when I try to emphasize to them that the most important thing they're supposed to do is not sell gasoline and hot dogs, but to treat others like you'd like to be treated. And I like the story because it happened long before I came to work for Quick Trip. So this is before I was the PR guy, you know. Well, I moved to La Crosse in 1993. Um, after finishing graduate studies in Rome. I met this wonderful old couple by the name of Genevieve and Ralph. And I'd go visit Jen and Ralph at least once a month, and I'm going to be real honest and tell you why. Every time I showed up, made this wonderful home-cooked breakfast, you know? The kind where, the, where it's a good breakfast because it's clogging your arteries, you know? <laughs> where the eggs are fried in the bacon grease. Okay? Uh, and Jen had baked the night before, so there'd just be this mound of, of sweet goods. It was phenomenal. Well, I'm like Pavlog's dog. If you put a treat in front of me, I'm going to keep coming back to the same spot where the treat is, you know? So once a month, I'd go to Jen or for breakfast. This went on for two years. One morning, I came in for breakfast, and Jen served me the toast, and the toast was completely dry. There was no butter or jam on the toast, uh, which was odd, because she was a phenomenal cook. Well, I, I didn't say anything. A month later, I stopped by for breakfast, and Jen served me the eggs. I like my eggs over easy. They were over and they were very easy. Uh, they weren't even white yet, it was still clear. And I had to work to slime those babies down, you know. But I was raised by a mom that if you're a guest at someone's house, you don't complain about the cooking, you just shut up and eat it, you know. So third month I showed up for, for breakfast and I walked into the kitchen, there was nothing ready for breakfast. Uh, and it was never an unannounced visit. They always knew when I was coming. And Jen's like, I, I'm sorry, I, I knew you were coming today and I knew it was about this time, but I don't have anything ready for breakfast. Uh, 
I don't remember how to turn on the stove. Well, it was the beginning stages of Alzheimer's. Uh, and then as soon as I realized that, that made sense why the eggs weren't done, no butter jam on the toast. And so that morning, uh, together, we made breakfast. And as was the tradition, when breakfast was finished, Ralph would always walk me out to the car. Jen would stay back in, in the house uh, cleaning up the dishes. And so Ralph walked me out that morning, and he said, Hey, John, uh, if it's okay with you, you can stop by for visits, but I, I think I'm going to stop having Jen make you breakfast. It's getting dangerous. Uh, she's starting to lose it. I said, Ralphie, no problem. Uh, I'll stop by for visits. You don't have to worry about feeding me. So then I'd stop by once a month for a visit. Every time I showed up, Jen and Ralph would be at their table, about the size of one of your tables, and, but they'd both be seated on the same side. And the other side of the table was a small television set that was also a built-in VCR unit. Remember those used to be more common in the 90s? And, and they'd have the volume just cranked up all the way. And I'd say, Ralphie, turn the TV down. I can't hear you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, they're always watching the same thing. They're always watching the Chicago Cubs on WGN. And this was the reason why. Uh, they'd grown up in Chicago, uh, got married at the age of 18, then moved to La Crosse to work in something called the rubber mills, which made boots for the military. I lost touch with the Cubs. Well, then when they retired in the mid-80s, they found out that they could get cable television. And with cable television in the La Crosse market, you get WGN, the Chicago station, that covers the Cubs every time they play. So when Jen and Ralph found out that they could watch their beloved Cubs in their kitchen in La Crosse in retirement, they were in heaven. That's what they were always watching. Well, I, I don't follow professional baseball that much. Uh, so uh, I stopped by for my visit with them in November, November, and they were watching the Cubs game. And I'm pretty sure they don't play professional baseball in November. Especially the Cubs, they're usually long gone and out of it by then, you know. <laughs> it was just enough to pique my curiosity. So then a month later, first week of December, I stopped by to visit Jen and Ralph, and they were watching the Cubs game again. But I noticed something. It was the same Cubs game that they had been watching when I was there in November. Obviously, it was taped. So again, Ralph would always walk me out to the car. And uh, as I was about to leave, I said, Ralphie, can I ask you one question? Are you watching the same Cubs game every time I show up? Oh, no, we don't watch them every time you show up. We watch the same game every single day. <laughs> like, Ralph, why do you do that? He said, well, we used to watch the Cubs live uh, on WGM, but in the days the Cubs would lose, Jen would be in this awful, foul mood the whole rest of the day. <laughs> she'd be angry. Uh, she'd be cantankerous. Um, I, you know, I couldn't get her to sleep at night. Uh, and if any of you have ever known someone with Alzheimer's, you know that their mood swings can be pretty dramatic and, and triggered by little things like that, you know. So Ralph said, what I did is I taped a game which the Cubs are losing. and the bottom of the ninth inning, they come from behind in this miraculous fashion, and they win. Jen doesn't remember that it's the same game every day. But at the end of the day, she's in this happy mood. Uh, she's content. Uh, when I put her to bed, she falls asleep right away at night. Um, and it, if that's what I have to do to be able to keep her at home, and so I don't have to put her in a nursing home, I'm happy to do that. He said, I got the whole game memorized. I know exactly when the commercial breaks are coming, how long my pee break can be so I don't miss anything. <laughs> that conversation was the first week of December. Uh, ten days later, Genevieve went downhill very quickly and she passed away. And I knew that Ralph was going to be lost without her because so much of his life, the last couple years of the marriage, was spent taking care of her. So I made this personal commitment. Instead of stopping by once a month, I'd stop by once a week. Matter of fact, I was there the Friday uh, after the funeral. Um, and we're at the kitchen table, and after you've been in that situation where you, when you say you're sorry, then you don't know what to talk about anymore, and there's this uncomfortable silence. And Ralph looked at me and said, You know what? we got to go back to the old days again. Remember when we used to come here, we used to eat together? We have to go back to eating together again. And I panicked, because I thought, I don't want to be a guinea pig for this 83-year-old guy <laughs> who decides now he's going to learn how to cook, you know? And he read the panic look at my face. He said, no, 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 I'm not, not saying that now. I got this all thought out. I thought about this ahead of time. And he gets up from his chair, and he goes over to the refrigerator. And he opens up the refrigerator, and he pulls out a package of our Quick Trip Twin Ham sandwiches. You see up there. He opens them up. Puts one sandwich in front of my spot, one in front of his. Now, uh, I probably shouldn't say this, it's being recorded. Uh, it's probably the crappiest thing we sell in our stores, okay? <laughs> I mean, it's a bun, a thin slice of ham, thin, like, it is, you know, okay? but it's the longest selling cold case sandwich, right? <laughs> so he shuffles back to the refrigerator, opens up a bottle of mustard, and reveals the fact that his mustard's been in there so long it's got the dried mustard snot on there, and his dried mustard snot's got pink fuzz growing off of it. <laughs> And I'm thinking to myself, oh, please, wipe that off, wipe that off. 
And he does, and he comes over to my spot, lifts up the top of the sandwich, squirts her all over the inside. <laughs> all over his. Puts the mustard back and then sits down across from me, proud as a peacock, and says, yeah, I got these for you because I know you love ham sandwiches. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't know where this guy ever got this idea from, but it became this tradition that every Friday, somewhere between 10 and 11, I would stop at Ralph's and we would share a package of Quick Trip Twin Ham Sandwiches. It's going on for six weeks. It's now in the middle of February. I'm thinking, I've got to get out of this, right? So again, Ralph would always walk me out to the car and i said, Ralph, uh, hey, you know, I'm always mooching off of you. Uh, you always go to Quick Trip and get the sandwiches. How about next week before I stop, I'll stop at Quick Trip and I'll get the sandwiches hoping that I could get one of our turkey subs or something other than those things, right? And as soon as I proposed that, he blew up at me. He said, don't you dare go get those sandwiches. I go get those sandwiches. I know you're coming on Friday morning, so I, I go to the store on Thursday afternoon. I, I walk into the store and I chat with all the ladies there. And then he just started bawling and he said, and I go to the register to pay for my sandwiches and the lady that's working the register, she always asks me how the Chicago Cubs are doing. And he just bawled. That conversation was the first part of February. On February 14th, Valentine's Day, he was at home. His daughter Mary, who lives in La Crosse, always would go to check on Dad in the morning. She walks into the house, and Ralph was standing in the kitchen with his hands on his hips, mad about something. And he never saw Ralph mad. I mean, this guy was so even killed, he watched the same Cubs game every day for years, you know? <laughs> and she said, Dad, what's the matter? Do you know what today is? And it didn't dawn on Mary. No, Dad, what? It's Valentine's Day today. And you know, this will be the first time in over 50 years I'll be without my sweetheart on Valentine's Day. I'll be darned if it's going to be the first. I'm going to be with Jen today. Mary left for work and didn't think anything of it. She got a call on that afternoon at 4.15. Ralph Madison was found in his house and his lazy boy chair passed away. A hands uh, folded on his chest and a big smile on his face. So strong was his love for his bride of 50 years, there's no way he wasn't going to be without Jenna on Valentine's Day. He's going to go be with her. Now the last eight weeks of Ralph's life when he went to our store, did he get something more than just twin ham sandwiches? The lady working the register, you think it was pure accident that she asked about the Chicago Cubs. Not at all. And that's the first story I tell to all our people when I say to them, it's not simply what you sell, uh, but how you sell it and how you do it with compassion. And that's what we want you to do now for the rest of your tenure. And now you say, you know what, I came to this talk about this guy from Quick Trip and all he did was tell a bunch of stories this morning. And that's intentional because that's how we train. There's different parts of your brain. There's a part of your brain called your cerebral cortex. It's a part of your brain. It's the part of your brain that remembers things like stories, excuse me, physics, mathematics, and HR policies. <laughs> the problem is it doesn't remember that information for very long. <laughs> Well, there's another part of your brain deep inside your, your, where your stem comes in called your limbic brain. And that's the part of your brain that remembers stories and stories with an emotional content. And if I can touch your limbic brain, you'll remember that lesson at least 12 to 15 times longer than anything in your cerebral cortex. So if I want to form a culture in which people do great customer service and they do it with compassion, when you come to training, you know what we're going to do? Is we're going to do nothing but tell stories. If you talk to anybody at Quick Trip and say, geez, I heard this guy talk about Quick Trip, they'll say, oh, it was John. And secondly, they'll ask you, did you bring Kleenex? Because in 15 years, they'll say, well, he's the storyteller. <coughs> but that's how you form great culture and compassion. You tell the stories, and when you tell the stories and you celebrate the stories, 21 stories becomes 2,335. And when you create that kind of culture of compassion, it happens not only in stores, but in communities, and it becomes a top workplace as well. And when you have purpose and compassion, good things happen not only in stores and communities, uh, and that's why we're there. Thanks for your time. Good to be with you. Okay. Brian, so we have, we have time for a couple of questions. Any questions, comments, concerns, rebuttals? Sure, go ahead. In the industry, how do you compare to others in turn of employees? Yeah, uh, the question is, how do we compare in our industry uh, in terms of employees? We have the lowest turnover rate uh, in our industry. Uh, in retail in general, and retail in general is about 100% turnover rate. In the C-store industry, convenience store industry, it's about 125%. Our turnover rate company-wide is about 23%. Uh, in La Crosse at the support center where all our production facilities are, we have about 3,000 coworkers. Our turnover rate in La Crosse is 1%. Uh, you don't leave, they carry you out. 
Okay, and the reason is because it's such a, such a great place to work, and not simply because of that culture of compassion internally, but we're privately owned. It's how the Zitlow family takes care of us. Uh, we're privately owned. Um, Forty percent of the pre-tax profits come back to all of its coworkers. And you say, well, that's not so great. That means the ownership gets sixty percent. Not true. Here's how it shakes out: twenty-seven point five percent of our income goes to pay Uncle Sam. We're an S corp. We're not a C corp. For those of you in business, no, we didn't get the same tax break. So we're still paying about twenty-seven point five percent when all is said and done. Twenty-seven point five percent of our profits go to build new stores, new production facilities. Uh, if you got any math wizards in the room, that means we got five percent left, and that goes back to the family. And that's all four generations: first generation, second generation, third generation, and fourth generation. Don, our CEO and owner, has never taken a raise in 25 years. CEO. Um, so what happens is they know we have ownership that also believes in us. So practically, how it shook out for all of us: um, in December, we have 30 meetings with all uh, 26,000 coworkers. Uh, it's myself and Don and some of the, the grandkids. Uh, we give it all the checks in this last year. Every single coworker got a 10% cash bonus. So if you're a frontline coworker, just started with us, you got a check for well over $2,200. And then 4.2% in your 401k, even if you didn't put a dime into it. Uh, even our part-timers get their 401k. Uh, and so when you have that kind of experience, people say it's a great place to work. Having said that, that profit sharing doesn't alone create a great workplace because if you study the Q12, the 12 questions from Gallup that make a great place to work, the bigger drivers not pay your benefits, but if you can answer yes to this statement, my supervisor or someone at work cares about me as a person. That's the biggest driver. So that's why we spend so much time internally about that compassion piece. So that's our turnover rate. Yeah. Anything else? As you've grown and got it, the expanded your territory, talk about the, how you distribute from La Crosse to keep everything fresh. And then you go into a new market, get all those great employees. <coughs> as you talk about and keep that culture. Yeah, the question is, as we grow, how do you continue to distribute product uh, and how do you keep that culture? Uh, we can only effectively at this stage uh, be a 300 mile radius out of La Crosse uh, because after that we can't do daily distribution anymore. So our market is Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa. We have 700 stores. We think we can probably fit another uh, 500 in our market without us having to expand elsewhere. Now we're stretching that limit just a tad bit, like if you go up to the Twin Ports, uh, Duluth Superior, what we do is we bring a truck as far as Rice Lake loaded and then somebody, another driver from uh, Twin Ports comes down and picks that trailer up and, and, and switches because uh, of DOT regulations we can't get somebody up there all the way distributing all the way back to La Crosse. So we're kind of cheating the system a little bit that right now. At some point in time we'll probably have to do another production facility or distribution center <coughs> elsewhere. Uh, but the sad thing for us is uh, you know, we built this organically, you know, over 53 years. So all of a sudden to build a dairy and a commissary and ice plant. I mean, even this year alone, we're, we're investing $650 million in capital expenditures. And most of that's back in La Crosse, uh, building an addition onto the kitchen so we can do more take home meals in the chicken program, more fresh food. We're gonna end up uh, cutting and slicing our own vegetables. For those of you who may have followed us, you know that we've gotten vegetables from Del Monte and we've had some food illnesses associated with that, uh, packages, stuff that, that we didn't have any control over. We want to control that ourselves because we know we can eliminate that. But to do that uh, organically is one thing. To all of a sudden establish a spot in Kansas City and build it, it would be astronomical cost. How do we keep the culture? As I mentioned earlier, if we have a brand new market, we actually send our training people out and do that. We also have a, a full team of 25 recruiters that are constantly recruiting people, uh, going out and finding people that, that fit that culture. Uh, and the good news is at this stage of the game, we're still pretty lucky. Uh, we still get a lot of applicants because we're also known as the top workplace uh, in all three states in which we operate. Here in Wisconsin, we're always in the top three, uh, usually number one, so yeah. Thank you. John, thank you for sharing the quick trip story and uh, teaching us, reminding us that the golden rule matters, that compassion matters, and that is cer certainly helping the people remember that they've, they're valued as a human being really matters a lot. So thank you, let's give John another round of applause. <laughs> I wanna, I got a, <clears throat> a little a note, a reminder, <clears throat> excuse me, every year the School of Business, uh, Schneider School of Business produces the state of the economy <clears throat> excuse me, then presents that to the community. <clears throat> It'll happen, <clears throat> excuse me. It'll happen again this year, February 13th uh, at 7.45 a.m. Uh, in Michael's Ballroom uh, right here at St. Edward College. Uh, registration is free, but required. Um, and encourage you to uh, check out the St. Norbert College website for the details. But February 13th here in Michael's Ballroom, it's a really fantastic presentation on the state of the economy. Um, and I'd like to also invite you to please join us at our next CEO breakfast on February 4th. So we'll remind you about the, the uh, state of the economy on the 4th. 
um, here at Cedar College. Craig Dickman, Managing Director of Tileton Tech, will present Designing a Collaborative Innovative Process with an Entrepreneurial Ecosystem. It will be a fantastic presentation from Craig. We, we invite you to come back and know that you're always welcome to come back to St. Norbert College and I hope to see you soon. Uh, thank you. Have a great day.